Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to this uh, early edition of the Subversive Podcast. Uh, I am Alex Kashuta, and today joining me is a special friend, a uh, philosopher and rationalist extraordinaire, the father or inventor or frighteningly the discoverer of the, the basilisk, uh, Rocco Miic. Welcome. Thank you, Alex. Pleased to, pleased to be on the show. I've um, I've known Rocco uh, from my pre-Twitter days, which is not something I can say about many people that I interact with nowadays. Um, I think I saw you the first time on um, Diego Calero's uh, timeline on Facebook, and you were oh, yeah. commenting some very cool stuff, and I was like, yeah, okay, this guy, friend, <laughs> ad. Um, and I think we've kind of been in the same kind of rationalist, EA, heterodox EA, EA plus, <laughs> or whatever, uh, yeah. circles for a bit. So that's kind of where I know you from. Um, obviously, your credentials uh, are, are pretty vast. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy you you came onto this uh, very incipient pod. <laughs> and uh, what a, yeah, what a chat about stuff. So I think my first question is about rationalism is about EA. Right. You call yourself a rationalist, you still call yourself a rationalist. Yes. Um, what is the what is the current state of rationalism? What's uh, what is attractive about it? What makes you want to be part of this this movement? Well, I'm not sure I want to be part of a movement um, be, because actually rationalism as a as like a set of people can be dysfunctional, and I've seen that uh, up close. But rationalism as in a set of ideas is extremely powerful. Um, and I, I think it's it's a, it's a toolbox that you know if if you'd been able to to send one thing back in time to me when I was 16, it would have been information to buy Bitcoin. But if there had been a second thing, if there had been a second thing, it would have been to um, look into some of the stuff to do with rationality, human cognitive biases, and probably the sort of core idea of rationalism, which is is the idea that um, what one should sort of examine the way one thinks about the world and you know consider that there are systematic biases that human beings happen to be a particular kind of animal like a chicken or a squirrel uh and and the, you know we we forget that we forget it at our peril and we forget the um the, the 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 biases and the distortions that 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 brings into the way we think about the world and you know quest, question the way you're thinking about things question the way you arrive at truth and do the same for other people and i think that that's just incredibly powerful and it takes you a long way in in, in solving a lot of sort of intellectual problems yeah that already sounds like almost a post-rational you know, approach in the sense that, you know, you kind of uh, lead with uh, with the biases, with the restraints, with the constraints of being of being mm. a human, um, yeah. or, or at least that's what I associate with it. Um, I well, think, I mean, yeah, yeah I, I mean, you know, honestly, I don't even know what post rat is. I'm, I'm not even sure it really refers to anything. It, it might just be like people trying to be cool and, you know, like, well, rationalist is kind of old, so we need to be something new. Let's be post rats. But that, I mean, there's some um, ribbon farm. I know has written some good things, but I mean, I guess you could just say it's a different flavor of rationalism. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's quite hard to distinguish. I mean, I've got an interpretation of what it could be, but I think it's just kind of being disgruntled okay. with the mainstream of rats. <laughs> just disgruntled. <laughs> just disgruntled. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I, I mean, actually, I guess it's important that I led with with the first thing, which was that you know you don't necessarily want to hang out with rationalists because because rationalists have problems, right? I mean personal problems you know <laughs> rationalists humans are a specific type of animal and and the ones who are best at rationality are often very bad at being human animals uh myself included i mean you know but but some other people much much more so and you know they have all sorts of problems and asperger's syndrome galore and they're dysfunctional and you know some of them might have paranoia you know they might they, they have all sorts of problems with them but these problems these ways that rationalists are broken as human animals actually fix them as reasoners because humans themselves are innately broken reasoners yeah, I think that's that's probably one of my my main concerns with the the rationalist type. It's hard to to 
to pinpoint what the source of their suffering is. Is it, you know, being someone who's, as you said, a bit of a broken human and that's why they're attracted to rationalism? Or is the rationalism itself sabotaging their life? It's, you know, it's a chicken no, and egg I, type I, situation. I, I, don't, I don't think rationalism per se is sabotaging people's lives. Uh, well, th there's maybe like something of an aspect of this. I think Jacob uh, from Put a Numb on It has an, a really good post about this. Um, where he talks about some ways in which rationalism can actually misfire and, and mess you up. But I think nowadays, at least people are pretty good at pointing that out and, and, and correcting it. Um, and, you know, going back a long way to the old days uh, of, of rationality back in, you know, the 20, 2008, 2009 kind of era when I was uh, sort of came into the scene, you know, people were always saying, look, you know, don't, don't go off and do anything crazy. Um, you know, everything that you learn about, you know, quantum mechanics and, uh, you know, Bayesian reasoning and all this stuff. And in most normal situations, it just adds up to normality. It just, it's just, just a justification for the things you were doing already under most normal circumstances. You should, if you think you should do something crazy, it means you, it means you're wrong. It doesn't mean that you should actually do something crazy and there are maybe like a few exceptions to this like there's this sort of uh, intersection between cryopreservation and rationality so um people who are rationalists are, are keen on uh signing themselves up for cryonics uh i haven't done that yet but i actually i actually plan to do it at some point hmm. hopefully before i die um but, <laughs> uh, uh you know so that there's but, but you see the thing is there like people's so this this is a case where people sort of innate instinctive behavior and then also the social reasoning that layers on top of that would both say that that's a bad thing and you shouldn't do it because you know like and then a bunch of justifications and reasons why it's bad that make absolutely no sense um but the, but the key thing is that you know people's behavior with respect to the problem of whether or not you should try and get cryopreserved is something that hasn't been filtered through history whereas people's you know people's behavior with respect to the problem of like you know how do i um what kind of birthday present should I get for my sister? Uh, you know, like rationalism probably doesn't have a better answer to that than what you, than what your aunt has. Right. Yeah. But uh, they, I mean, maybe it does, but it probably doesn't. Right. And there is um, a certain kind of deconstructivism that comes with, with rationalism where it's like, okay, we have the, the flawed human animal. Like, you know, I'm yeah. essentially talking about things like, like polyamory is really, really popular oh, yeah. in, in mm. rationalist circles. It's <laughs> this idea that, oh, you know, jealousy is just like oh, a little bug there. You can, yeah. It's, you know, something we can overcome and this thing we can mm. overcome and I can overcome this and that. And then you end up with these deconstructed, put together lives that are right. like chosen right. by the mm. rational individual. But they seem to be like car crashes if you just look yeah, at them. Yeah, from... they, they contradict human nature. Yeah, I mean, um, so that, there's an aspect of that. Um, but I mean, you know, this is one of those cases where I think you have to be very careful to distinguish between... Um, rationality the kind of philosophical or the, the modern like sort of philosophical uh rationality movement that's centered around less wrong and elias yudkowski and people like that versus the actual communities who you will find on the west coast of the usa mostly um <laughs> who, who are kind england of... as well yeah actually there are a few more in in the uk now although i i've only very very um sparingly had contact had like personal contact in london london's big really big community okay. yeah um but like you know so for example poly is something that i think is potentially a good idea for some people but almost certainly a really bad idea for most people um because you know sexual jealousy is you could say it's a bug of the human mind if you come at it from a sort of utilitarian point of view like why can't we just all have sex with everybody and delete jealousy and the amount of sex and fun would increase and everyone would be happy but it doesn't work like that because so there are some practical problems like you know a, a, a single like pair bond is, is simpler than like you know a, a triplet because you've suddenly tripled the number of links and the number of relationships and stuff like that but the, but the more serious problem with it is that again you know it's like you're trying to teach squirrels how to swim right maybe there are a few squirrels who are really good at it right and they can they can they can cross the english channel you know but the majority of them will be wet and sad and lonely and and it'll be a disaster and they will they will hate you for trying to do this swimming thing with them uh humans you know 
poly for humans is is it's it's pl really playing with fire, playing with evolved defenses against uh, cockoldry and men. Um, you know, playing against sort of evolved defenses, presumably in women as well, with uh, with sexual jealousy for for splitting the the sort of uh, economic uh, effort that a man will put into children. So you know, I mean, I think it's something that that's may maybe like fun to kind of hack around with with a bunch of people who are all kind of um, you know kind of a little bit weird anyway, and maybe they maybe their like jealousy modules kind of broken anyway, so they don't really even need to do very much. Uh, but for the average person, I think uh, that's very dangerous. Although, and it's not even that new, though. I mean, people people used to do swinging and stuff, right? That's yeah, of course. It's the seventies, definitely <laughs> put a yeah. dent in, in yeah. culture. Um, yeah. And I think you know, some form of monogamish is probably the the standard for humans. You know, the idea that you know people have never cheated on their wives or never went to prostitutes or something. It that's part of the human experience. But I think Polly just wants to say, oh, because people have doing this on the side, the whole system's fucked. So we really need to we need to <laughs> just sort out this this combination where you have this yeah. this combinatorial nightmare of relationships you have to manage um you know it's a uh, factorial yeah. of, of disasters so yeah it's uh i don't i don't really um, see it and my my main gripe with it is just it's, it's a coordination nightmare and also okay anyone well, i wouldn't know i've never tried it so uh, no no not on not on like the proximal level but i mean like at a societal level it's the idea oh, that the if you yeah. if you if you normalize this stuff and this is kind of my my you know hobby horse it's the idea mm -hmm. that if you tell you know a, a whole generation of young people that oh you know polyamory is just as good as monogamy and you should try yeah. it because you know if you're a smart person you know like the, the whole argument from from polyamorous people is that uh, mm -hmm. it's not for everyone you need to be really rationalistic oh, you have to have high emotional intelligence really smart you know if you tell that to anyone like most people will think that yeah that's me i am i am yeah, really they're rational tr they're trying to use it to like signal their uh it's like it's like it's a test of your quality as a human but i i mean no i mean i think honestly you know it's something that i would um personally not get into um and and, and i would describe myself as somebody with fairly low sexual jealousy and I still wouldn't get into it, mostly because because it would just be setting up an unstable situation that, that that's you know um, unstable. And when it when it you know if it goes bang, if it if it explodes, then uh, you have sort of permanent damage to your life that you can't undo. I mean, maybe if life was like a computer game and you could reload, yeah. I could do it. And especially if you want to have children, I mean, this is a bit you know having um, mm. people with low to no parental investment, especially like sexual partners. I mean, people who optimize for sexual variety, you know, might tend to come from a certain pool of people that, you know, you might not necessarily want to have around your children. I don't know, obviously, mm. I don't want to, I don't want to load it up with that. But, you know, instances of, of abuse uh, in people who are, you know, are not kin, um, you know, in, in the family environment, yeah. quite high. Um, yeah. yeah, obviously, not to tar any specific community with this, but this is just, you know, the, the nature of man, if it's not your kid, you might get crazy ideas. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's definitely not for a family. But, you know, I mean, for example, Jacob, as I said, from Put a Numb on it seems to be making a pretty good run out of it. So, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, but then, but then again, maybe, maybe it'll go wrong for him in like 10 years time, or maybe he'll quit it in 10 years time or five years or who, who knows. I mean, it's, it's you know, low sample size. And from, from what I hear, most people tend to quit it, actually. Um, yeah, that's, that's been my experience with with the community and i mean i th i think if you have the choice between cheating and like getting into poly you know i, I think you should get into poly <laughs> but i think yeah. even better you should you know just make a commitment to somebody put a ring on it um which is actually another the third piece of advice that i that i could have i wish i could have sent back to my 16 year old after learn rationality sorry buy bitcoin number one learn rationality number two number three would be be you know be more ready to put a ring on it not sort of infinitely but you know really consider that um yeah. as, as something that you should be looking for and, and that was advice I never really got as a child from uh, from my parents or really from anyone else. The advice that I, you know, all the, all the stuff that I got fed as a child is like freedom, 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 choice, 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 competition, 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 competition. And, you know, that there are, again, there are aspects of those that are correct, but it's not the whole story. 
Yeah, that's exactly kind of my experience as well. I mean, I was, you know, a lot of a lot of people infer that, you know, being from Eastern Europe, I've kind of grew up in some trad farm or something. But no, my, my parents were boomers. It's all about yeah. about freedom and, and optimizing optionality. And um, that's yeah, essentially yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. the next question I want to ask you is exactly about freedom, because I think we have, you know, we're kind of have some convergent thoughts about freedom and about the limits of freedom and mm. uh, because I feel like freedom is a bit like um, democracy or empathy, like this, you know, uh, like orb of virtue, an unalloyed, <laughs> you know, amazing word that you can't ever attack, or you're you're, you're probably or you're some, evil. yeah, yeah don't, some form don't of... attack our freedom. But but actually, I was uh, I was just watching a documentary on the, the BBC on iPlayer about this area in Leeds uh, that they've opened up for prostitutes, and it just sort of goes through the lives of these prostitutes and they're, they're they're addicted to drugs they're having sex with strangers i mean sorry just can you just let me know what words am i allowed to say on this uh and what do I have to kind of censor myself? <laughs> this is uh, definitely not a, a kid's show, so I not think... Not a kid's show, okay. No. So, you know, they're having sex with strangers um, for money, and then they're spending the money on drugs. And in some sense, those are all, like, free choices that these women are making. Um, but, you know, they're actually enslaved to the drug. And it's... They've created... They're living in a nightmare of their own creation. Um, they don't need freedom. They need uh, constraint. They need to be, you know, they need to be taken away and put in an environment where they cannot get the drug and their lives will be a lot better. And obviously given, you know, help and companionship and all of these other things, but they, they don't need more freedom. These, these people are dying of freedom. Worse, they're torturing themselves uh, because, you know, their brains have been hacked by a drug. You know, I think it's like... Uh, they're, they're smoking crack, basically. Um, but it's it's far from, it's just a very extreme example. And, and I, maybe I can send you the link to it. Um, but, you know, freedom is not good for these people. Freedom is freedom is hell for them. It's it's poisonous. Yeah. And, and, and freedom is freedom is poisonous to all of us to some extent. Um, I, I related over Twitter some of the problems that I had with a particular drug uh, <laughs> called Martella that uh, I have some problems with. <laughs> but uh you know it's it's actually much easier to deal with a nutella addiction than uh than a crack addiction so uh, <laughs> well I, I i assume so i never had the latter but uh yeah i mean you know fr freedom and and so so some of the things i've been posting on twitter have been about uh you know the idea that food is very optimized and um you know the the brain the way our brains work the way they actually work, not the way we imagine they work, but the way they, the way they actually work is that they assign huge reward values to, to foods which are both convenient and calorie dense. So if you present somebody with a chocolate bar that's 100 miles away locked in a safe, it's not very tempting. But if it's right there in front of you, your brain like automatically increases its value um, and you know, it can be extremely hard to resist. And, and this has been shown in research. They, they take people and they put them in a research environment where they have basically vending machines that will vend every type of delicious food for free. And these people like eat double their daily calorie intake and they become obese. And it's very easy to do, uh, you know, pretty much everyone gets hacked by this. And then they take the same people and they put them in an environment where there are vending machines that will vend basically that goopy stuff that they ate in the matrix kind of like soylent <laughs> right yeah. uh, and these people just the pounds just drop off them because it's just it's just not interesting it's their brain assigns a low value to it because it doesn't have these cues uh that we that we evolved to respond to in the in the, in the hunter-gatherer environment um and it was again there was this there was a, there was a book i was reading about this this was uh Gine's, um book the hungry brain which mm -hmm. goes through this uh, very thoroughly yeah, and this isn't the only optimization function that we're subjected to as uh, as modern uh, denizens of modernity. Um, yeah. the, I think that the market itself is essentially a creator of of you know yeah. optimization functions of this type yeah. because the market is there to serve you the thing that you will buy, and the best, the yeah. easiest way to make you a perpetual buyer of something is to essentially make you addicted to something that is just yeah. so good that you will cash out every time you see it or, you know, you are essentially a surf to the product. Um, and you yeah. can see this from, you know, I don't know, everything from, you know, apps 
which are essentially mm -hmm. have slot machine yeah. logic in them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. To porn, which now has slot machine logic in it, which apparently is one of the really? appeals of OnlyFans. OnlyFans apparently gives you uh, intermittent rewards. Um, so you never know when, when the beaver shows up. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'm sorry. Really? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a subscriber. Yes. I, I'm, I'm not a subscriber. Somebody suggested I should actually start an OnlyFans. So, uh, you know, you never know. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, all of, all of these things, you know, all of these things are, I, I guess you could, you could call them hostile, hostile entities, which are out there to get you. Um, you know, there's, as, as we said, drugs, um, which fortunately are illegal and that most drugs are illegal, not all of them. There's cigarettes and, and alcohol, which are legal drugs. And only very recently have we started to constrain the tobacco optimizers ability to advertise to people and try and get them hooked. Thank God. Um, because I mean, how many people have died of that? It's tens of millions have been killed by that particular, um, nasty uh, malevolent optimizer that we unleashed on ourselves but it's you know it's also like notifications and tech social media i mean i i use social media too much probably um and also you know computer games as well a lot of people use computer games too much uh, i've done that personally um not to not to an extreme extent but but more than i should have done uh you know some people just like for some people world of warcraft is crack cocaine I know. <laughs> My husband really likes Warzone, so I, I know. <laughs> Warzone? What's, what's Warzone? Is it's call, call of Duty. No, it's Call of oh, Duty. Call of Duty, yeah. right. Okay. But he's really good. <laughs> he's re what? Like, uh, he's really good as a husband or he's really good at Call of Duty? He's uh, extraordinary as a husband, <laughs> but he's also really good at Call of Duty. <laughs> okay, 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 yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, all, all of these things, you know, they, as you say, I mean, the problem is their reward function is the amount of money you spend. Um, rather than the amount of utility you gain. And the problem is, you know, human beings are not unitary, um, coherent utility maximizing agents with a goal. We're more like a sort of collection of different sort of agents that are all strapped together. So when you have that jar of Nutella in front of you that you just can't resist because it's right there. But if it was, you know, a hundred meters over there, suddenly it wouldn't be interesting. Um, you know, that's, there is an agent in your mind, a very primitive one that was honed over, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of years of hunting and gathering. And the way that was honed was in our ancestral environment, we, we actually did occasionally come across honey. And it was, you know, an extremely rich source of calories um, that was easy to digest, instant hit of calories. And people would, would find the, you know, bee nests and basically go at it and steal the honey from the bees and get stung five times, but they would get like a pint of honey from it. So the reward has to be really high because you've got to go and fight bees for that honey. Whereas, you know, nowadays you go to, um, you go to a, a news agency, you go to an off license and, uh, you know, they have, they have infinite honey there. They have, you know, Cadbury's boost bars. Uh, God, I love boost bars. Um, you know, so everything. British. <laughs> this is such everything. a British thing. <laughs> They're so nice though, aren't they? They just, oh my God. Yeah. And I think they even have like some other drug in them as well, don't they? Um, Caramel. But, uh, That's I think, no, I think, they, I think they have something else in boost bars. They have like guarana or something. I, I don't know what they have in them, but, they, but whatever it is, it's good. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, I mean, so, so basically you are this kind of like... Um, you're this, you're this sort of hodgepodge of different agents, some of which are quite sophisticated. You know, I mean, I think about uh, making small investments in cryptocurrency, right? And I have to sort of, you know, do probability calculations and look at market indicators and stuff like that. That's a very sophisticated uh, kind of algorithms I'm running. I mean, maybe I use a spreadsheet for it. But then there's also this low level agent which sees the honey and just like, just hacks you and it's like, must grab the honey, you must grab the chocolate, right? Um, <laughs> And so because humans are just not um, sophisticated or, or not entirely sophisticated, entirely coherent agents, you know, the environment can sort of pull us to pieces in the sense that you have one, um, 
stimulus that can pull you in one direction that the rest of you really didn't want to go in, but the stimulus can, can sort of empower that part of your mind so much that the rest just can't resist it. Uh, and then this happens with, you know, with, with the OnlyFans thing, you know, with people just not being able to resist the, 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 the stimulus, especially males. I mean, are there, are there that many women who use OnlyFans? I don't know. I would be very surprised if there was. There's probably a few. I yeah, mean, but of course. It's mainly males who are seeing the stimulus of naked females. And that stimulus is really, like, really, really important for males in order to, you know, have a baby, you have to find a naked female and you have to have sex with her. And so the OnlyFans stimulus looks like a naked female. So does Pornhub. But you see, OnlyFans also gives you that kind of emotional connection as well. So it makes it even more realistic. And you feel like you're passing your genes on, but you're not. You're just getting exploited. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, there are all of these things that exploit people and it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse because human beings are never going to get any software updates. Well, at least not in, not in the medium term, not in the next 30 years. Maybe in 100 years, there'll be a way of like updating people's brains. But, you know, we would become very different people yeah. uh, if, we, if we were updated to, to deal with this and actually become utility maximizers. We would be, we would be inhuman. Um, so we're never going to get updates. But all of the tech for making these malevolent optimizers gets better all the time. Um, and so it'll be only fans and then they'll have neural link and then there'll be only fans, but it's in your head. Um, and it'll really feel like it. And you'll, you know, you'll have people who will be able to extract all of the money from many, many, many different people. And then God knows what else they'll invent. Um, but it, it will get better. It'll get harder. And the things that give that, that sort of our lot more long-term parts of our brains find valuable, like maybe, you know, having, friendship having a good career maybe having a family all of those things will be left in the dust because they are harder to monetize or impossible to monetize nobody there's no company really that monetizes um your relationship with your friends yeah and it's going to be pretty hard to optimize for that because it's just a, a multifactorial long term you know you can't really attach instant you know they're just an instant level i mean i don't even think it's i don't even think it's that hard to to do it's just nobody's bothering to do it because it's it's more of a long-term thing it's it's you know people would be more it's just more difficult to extract money from people doing that there i actually did try using an app that was that was like a sort of um and this is going to sound really weird like a friendship management app but it, it kind of doesn't have very many users it's not very good uh, but the idea is it would sort of automatically track uh, people who you talk to um, and it would kind of, you know, allow you to have like a, like a sort of dashboard for that and like, oh, you should reach out to this guy you haven't talked to him for a while. I mean, it sounds kind of Aspie and yeah, you know, I am an Aspie, so I need this stuff. But yeah. uh, sounds pretty good, actually. <laughs> it sounds pretty good, right? It sounds pretty good, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of people can actually do with that and that would, you know, maybe that could be your home screen instead of your apps. You'd have your friends on your home screen. Right. Yeah. And then you, there would be a specific button you could press that would maybe then get you through to the apps. And the, the default view would be maybe your friends and your life goals. Yeah. Right. But that's not what the, our friends look like. The, the problem there is that friends in like the, the immediate sense are a hassle. I think now we're at yeah. the point where, you know, even interacting with friends is a bit of a hassle, you know, you're having yeah. to have that social coordination, having to, you know, maybe have disagreements with your friends or, you know, yeah. all sorts of, you know, friction, social friction. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it's enough of a hassle to make people not want to really yeah. go through with it. I mean, to be honest, I see yeah. it in myself. Like I've, I used to be a, much more of a social butterfly. Obviously COVID doesn't help, but no, um I feel like my, my tolerance for even ordinary social friction um, has gone down drastically. Yeah, and I mean, if, if, you, if you get in touch with somebody, maybe you always worry slightly that you're kind of bothering them a little bit, you know, um, yeah. do they really want to talk to me now? And that in itself is just a slight disincentive, or maybe you haven't talked to them for a while and then you feel a little bit guilty about that. So you're like, do I really want to deal with that guilt right now? Maybe not, I'll just go on Facebook or, or I'll exactly. call GP or whatever instead, and because that's not gonna, there's never gonna be a punishment signal from that. Yeah, and right? social media is, you know, essentially knows me, you know, it knows what to serve me. And even the friends that mm. I've chosen on social media know exactly yeah, what you, I want to talk you, about. You it's see, so you see, I, I have solutions to this. I, I have some, I have some good solutions to the, uh, 
the attention optimizer. There, 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 there are several. Op there are three optimizers, right? The, Tell me. <laughs> um, the the attention optimizer, aka anything with notifications in a feed. The food optimizer, aka anything that you can like grab with your hand and put in your mouth, like uh, you know, um, skittles or or Nutella. <laughs> or not oh my god, do I no later? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's there's the food optimizer, the the attention optimizer. Um, and uh, then there's the porn optimizer or the uh, the sex optimizer. You know, you've got your OnlyFans, your Pornhub, that kind of thing. I have absolutely no interest in that. It just doesn't do anything for me, luckily. Um, Good to know. <laughs> but, uh, well, no, I mean, I have <laughs> interest in the real thing, but not in the not in the fake version. That's good. You, you dodged a bullet there. It's a, it's a big thing. People are really nutty yeah, about it nowadays. Yeah. yeah. Really nutty. Yeah. <laughs> 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 apparently um, but uh yeah for, for the for the attention optimizer i think basically it's actually not that difficult to beat um what we need to do is we need to make programs that kill the notifications and the feeds so i've actually done that with facebook so i don't have a well i actually do have a facebook feed but it only has posts from like one or two groups that are very practical um like they're not interesting they're just like you know i'm looking for a second hand car type groups that i need to keep an eye on uh and the notifications uh there's a there's an element blocker that i've used that just blocks that um so, so that tell is me about twitter because that's my problem <laughs> how do you, how do well, you solve if, it? the thing is you know I, I see twitter as kind of like a like like a sort of not 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 so much like an addiction as a sort of um a side hustle so i've i've also killed most of the notifications on twitter i've killed as many of them as twitter will let you kill but uh i still get notifications from people who follow me and who i follow yeah that's what i've done as well it's but been it's, it's still a little bit more than is ideal but yeah yeah it's uh it's it's an interesting app i have never oh, been yeah, so sorry. I, I should also say I've also killed my Twitter feed as well. So so I've um, redirected um, I've redirected the Twitter homepage to my own profile. So I don't see the Twitter feed. I don't even know what it looks like. Oh, okay. I don't know. I think that's that's quite. I, I really derive a lot of uh, a lot of pleasure from the Twitter feed. I, I hate I hate the feed. I, I hate it because it it serves up um, it serves up things, and and this is the same as the food. It serves up things that talk to my kind of like brainstem in some sense rather than my uh you know cerebrum <laughs> i probably got the neuroscience horribly wrong but you know it serves up like cute pictures of cute videos of cats that you just click oh it's so cute you know um but that was what like what type five of twitter do you have mine's all just, just like right wing <laughs> talking points and stuff. no but it's like people people post them people you know people who mostly talk about um something political or technological or whatever they occasionally post cat videos and then a lot of people click them and the twitter feed notices this and it promotes those a lot so even if most of the people that you're following are talking about things that are mostly serious you see cat video cat video cat video dog video dolphin video you know picture of like and then like like picture of like a cute town in italy and it's like oh look at this look at this nice town trad aesthetics like, yeah trad aesthetics <laughs> like all of that shit and i hate it i hate it i don't hate the, the stuff i just hate having it sort of injected into my into my sort of stream of consciousness and it, it's it's incredibly distracting and i hate it so i can't stand the twitter feed and there's no the only way i fixed the only way i ever fixed that was by unfollowing everyone and uh, that was too drastic because it, it i think it actually destroyed um, my own uh, profiles um like rating on twitter i think if you don't follow Ooh. everyone it, it, it wrecks you um so so i've just basically taken uh, the twitter feed off um but i still use twitter way too much um but the thing is i i see the bit of a hustle uh you know i have my I have my substack grifts so uh you know at least i get a little bit of money from it exactly uh, heretical so update dot heretical update yeah yes. absolutely uh i have my substack up the um substack grifts so it's it's not entirely an addiction it's a hustle and you know i make contact that's what i tell it. myself all the time no it's, it's <laughs> great it's it's really good I've, I've i've gotten so much opportunity i mean the fact that yeah, i'm even doing yeah. this is all twitter derived you know twitter's been yeah. a boon for me but uh it's also been i mean i've been a smoker so i know i know a little bit about addiction smoking is nothing 
it is nothing compared to Twitter. Twitter, <laughs> Twitter makes me wake up at 4 a.m. thinking about a really good tweet or ruminating about something someone said about me that was really mean like two weeks ago. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's ridiculous. But no, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm starting to get a hang of it. But it's been, it's been like getting hit by a mimetic train, like really, because I've never been on Twitter until this September when I got on it. Uh, and I knew... I knew it was kind of like scary powerful because I've browsed yeah. it a little bit before, but I was like, yeah, whatever. I'm never going to come on it. But then I was like, oh, if you're, if you're a writer on the internet, maybe you should be on Twitter. Jumped on it and then psh, like a face hugger, it, it <laughs> corrupted me completely. Yeah. No, I, 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 have, I have another solution for that. I have an app on my phone that uh, basically blocks all my apps after 11 uh, p.m. until 18. Hmm. And, and how and how strong is it? How strong is its, it's magic? You can't you can't deactivate it. I've actually mm -hmm. it's actually annoying because I set it to deactivate itself on the first of January, and there's a few apps that I accidentally blocked that I shouldn't have done. Like my banking app only works for five minutes of every hour now or something. Um, I can't undo it. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's pretty strong. Yeah. So so I've I've set that up as well. Uh, pe people are going to listen to this and think that I'm some kind of uh, com you know addict with no self control, but I think it's actually I think there's maybe an element of truth to that. But at the same time. Uh, it's actually no matter how much willpower you've got unless it's infinity which is nobody it's actually better to have these systems yeah it's, it's absolutely essential like I've, it's just, I've there, it's just there a bit of hassle set up yeah i've learned i have no willpower not much <laughs> you know like fra fragments little little bits of willpower um <laughs> It's yeah. Well, it's one one other thing I want to talk to you about is something that you mentioned recently, and I think it's it's interesting. It's this this concept of trad humanism. Um, I saw you post about it. Yeah, it's um it's a fun little play on words. Uh, you know, I mean, I've I've been associated with trad and with humanism in a way. Um, what is it? What's so what's interesting about it? Is it? Well, I think I think it's something that this guy um, associated with uh, Blue Book Cities came up with. Um, let me just find. Uh the um and deets of that details um so uh yeah let me see um we have um we have where is it now um uh, did you block your feet uh, again <laughs> no i just i just can't find it um yeah so we so we have this guy called dryden um dryden brown Who's, uh, who's doing this, uh, this thing called um, Blue Book Cities, which I, I think the idea is to create a city-state, um, so like somewhere. Cool. It might, might, like even, Athens, might even be in Croatia. Sparta? Might even, might even be in Croatia. Oh, not a bad city. There's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of islands you see in the Adriatic, so um, that would be mm -hmm. very good. There's, there's like a thousand one of them or something. I mean, a lot of them are tiny, but a lot of them are like uh, you know, you could totally do a city-state. I love uh, it. Adriatic Decentralized. Island. Can it be trad? <laughs> Well, I mean, maybe. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure how, how trad the Blue Book people are. Um, and Croatia is becoming less trad over time as well, um, remarkably. Like Croatia. everywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Romania as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so basically, uh, the, the way I described it was perhaps a little bit uncouth. Um, but, it, but it's like, instead of using techno... So if you look at a, if you look at a lot of transhumanism stuff, you see a lot of um, sort of weirdness signaling. You see a lot of people with, with um, you know, piercings or they've embedded a magnet in their finger or they have like 573 tattoos or but like one of them's a QR code or just something weird like that. Um, and that makes sense because you know, anything that's new tends to attract people who are attracted to new things, which essentially means people who are weird in some way, right? <laughs> but um, that's fine. That's normal. That happens with everything. Um, I'm, I'm sure the, f you know, the first people to do, to do, to, the first we do the, in the first people who use the internet were not representative of the typical internet user today, right? Um, they were nerds because the internet was hard to use. Um, the, you know, the first people who used emails used it from the command line. I, find that really hard to believe that people did actually write emails from the command line 
uh, for those who don't know, the command line on Linux is like when you, you know, it's like you, ha you have a, a text only interface with a computer. Um, yeah, I've used it a few times. I felt really yeah. powerful. <laughs> yeah, like, like, like you're some kind of super hacker or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, so the, the first people who, who thought about uh, transhumanism, which I guess I would define as transforming humans using technology into something different, um, where that something can be anything. Uh, the first people who got interested in that are people who are different. I'm a person who's quite different and quite weird in my own ways. So, you know, I've been interested in this for a long time. That makes sense. But the sort of pioneers of transhumanism, the people who, who explore it to begin with, are, are unlikely to be anywhere close to representative of what it actually turns into, even if things go well, right? So the idea of transhumanism is, is, or perhaps my take on it, because it's not my idea, it's... Um, it's, it's dried and I think default friend also uh, contributed to this. My take on it would be instead of, using trans, uh, instead of using technology to make people more weird and give them tattoos and magnets and stuff like that just because it's weird and cool, um, you use technology to, um, to, to allow people to live lives that are actually more like lives in a sort of idealized version of the past. You know, think Rivendell from Lord of the Rings, right? Um, so, you know, pe people are living uh, in a life that has a lot of, a lot of, perhaps a lot of nature in it, perhaps a healthier, um, less atomized social environment. Um, perhaps they're more physically healthy. Um, perhaps uh, they they have you know other things mm. that that are, that are you know that are good that are going on. But they but they don't have you know magnets embedded in their fingers. Uh, and are they just just to be cool? Just to be. Is like, it just man. a question of aesthetics or what? particularly about it would be trad from your perspective. Well, I, th I, th right. What would be, what would be traditional? So, um, tradition as people have pointed out covers a lot of different things and it isn't one thing. It's, it's a range of, of social systems and adaptations, uh, to deal with social life in places that are quite different than the kind of times and places that we live in today. So for example, places where material goods, uh, are more scarce. Uh, perhaps also places where, because of scarcity, human relationships matter a lot more. Uh, perhaps also um, places and times in which people are better adapted in the sense that they actually have a family rather than like, you know, having three cats and then ending their bloodline. Um, so you could, you could have all of those things under the umbrella of traditionalism and then there's various ways to do this in, you know, the Islamic world and the Christian world all over the place. Um, so there are perhaps certain aspects of modernity, uh, like if we go back to what I was talking about earlier with the prostitutes in England who are addicted to crack cocaine and they have sex with strangers uh, in order to get money to buy more uh, cocaine, you know, um, like that's, that's a modern mm -hmm. lifestyle. That's not a traditional lifestyle uh, because that's simply, those options were simply not available um, in, you know, if you go back a certain number of hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. you, you could be a prostitute, but you probably couldn't be a prostitute who was addicted to crack. You'd be addicted to opium. <laughs> or some Maybe other... you could be addicted to I mean, that, that, should, yeah, that has happened. Laudanum, right? um, who knows what disasters. Sure, all, all sort, yeah, and that, that again has happened in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, you know, if you go back to a small village community rather than, a, rather than a historical city, it's probably a bit less likely that you would have a lot of people doing that in a small village because there would be arbiters of morality who would p crack mm -hmm. down on that. Right. So, um, would um, what kind of trad humanism be essentially using the tools of, of humanism, or essentially rationalism, or kind of the the technology that's empowered yeah. us to get to modernity, um, like you know maybe AI or optimization yeah. functions like the market itself, mm. but um, under like a, a subsidiary to the to the goals of kind of a, a superstructure or like, um, you know, there, there would be social goals to which these tools would be, would yes. have to be a priori dedicated. Yes, exactly. Um, you would, you would give these tools a utility function that wasn't simple, right? So, so if you look at the, the kind of food optimizer, the food optimizer's utility function is basically maximize money subject to some regulations about not poisoning people. Right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, maybe in a sort of, in a more like trad futurist or trad humanist uh, kind of um, setting, you know, your food optimizer would actually not be trying to optimize money at all. It would be like trying to optimize people's figures and their health, 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. But uh, Rocco, isn't that fascism? <laughs> Telling people what to do from a <laughs> from a superordinate structure that knows what's best for them? <laughs> isn't that fascism? Um, <laughs> well, I, I, I think there's I think there are perhaps elements of that that you could find in fascism. Um, there are certainly elements of that that you could find in fascism, but I mean, there, there are elements of that that you could find in, you know, religions that go back thousands of years. Um, pretty fash. <laughs> <laughs> right. C Christianity, you know, pretty fash. fash. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think that, I think the key difference here, and I know there are a lot of people who've gone a little bit nuts about this recently <laughs> on Twitter. The key, the key difference here is that, that fascism has some other aspects, uh, to do with, sort of national military power. Uh, it's very much bound up with the nation. Uh, you, you can't really have a fascist village. Um, I mean, you can have a fascist village within a fas fascist nation, but you can't just have one village that invents its own brand of fascism because it, like, it wouldn't have, you know, enough, mm -hmm. I don't know, like tanks and stuff, right? <laughs> um, yeah, but I but guess the, you, could do, you could do trad humanism at any level of abstraction. You could do it it probably would have to be some sort of local thing. I don't think everyone would buy into it where you'd have the magnet people outside of the gates of the of Rivendell trying to do their own thing. So it would be at least some form of civic nationalism or a civic, you know. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could have a city state, right? So you could have a city state where, um, you know, they didn't sell addictive food. Or maybe they did sell it, but not everyone's credit card would work for it. So you'd have but a you'd debit have card. to have really serious borders <laughs> to prevent people from going next door and getting the addictive food. Well, maybe maybe you don't have to have particularly like would I would I go on a two hour boat ride to get Nutella? No, I wouldn't. But if it's right in front of me, yeah, I would. So so maybe you know you have a city state where there isn't addictive food, or maybe um, you know all of these other things. Maybe OnlyFans is banned. You know, no OnlyFans, no Pornhub, Gosh. doesn't just doesn't exist. You try and connect to it doesn't work um or any of any of the other systems that can that you could describe as sort of predating on human beings as exploiting human beings uh as kind of treating human beings as exploitable money pumps to extract money from all of these systems could be bad yeah. um, the amish are essentially doing this at an extreme level but it's essentially kind of a huge filter to to every modern yeah corruption. So, 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 but the the aim the difference between the, the Amish and sort of this like trad futurism or trad, trad humanism thing is that there's, there's nothing futurism about, about the Amish. Then they're, they're just trad. Yeah. But what, you know, who would decide which types of technologies? Cause a lot of these technologies, mm. you know, you wouldn't have known of their corrupting influence until you tested it out and really, really saw the externalities, networks, uh, network effects and yeah, all this yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. Um, mm. and lock-in effects and all sorts of stuff. Mm. Um, so, you know, who is the, the, the group of elders who says, yeah, we really need this, this new fangled AI that we don't know what's going to what it's gonna do so right as in as in who, who makes the decisions basically yeah yeah mm. well i mean i think i think this is probably something that that is like the, the big question mark the, the big thing that that isn't decided and one one possibility for that is blockchain technology so you would have uh, a distributed uh, sorry decentralized autonomous organization that decided those things so you would you could basically vote um on what those laws are going to be now of course the problem is voting on laws it will will open up a whole separate can of worms uh you know like a really big one that, that will be too complicated to go into but but that there's there are certainly sort of scope there for creating systems which um which are trustless systems you don't have to have some like grand sort of uh you know like grand pope of holiness who decides these things but maybe maybe there is like a, a smart contract that has these things written into it and you can opt into it if you want to a sort of smart constitution um so a smart contract is a self-executing contract a smart constitution would be a self-executing contract that determines the laws within a particular um a particular state and it might be a, an online only state it might be a country that only exists online and those those laws might only apply to your online interactions but then maybe later on it, it sort of grows um a physical uh, manifestation where those laws apply and then because because it would be um you would use modern technology it would use blockchain technology you would 
you know, you, you, would, you would get rid of the principal agent problem, so you would know what that smart constitution was going to do. You'd know exactly what it was going to do. Now, of course, that's, that's a very rough, you know, view from 60,000 feet kind of sketch of how these things could work. And maybe it won't work like that at all. Um, but, that, but that's one possible answer you could have. So you could basically say, you know, we are going to solve the principal agent problem and solve various public goods problems using technology. And I know the Ethereum community has actually done some work in these areas. Um, there's also the radical exchange community who work on that as well. Um, but I mean, obviously, this is a fledgling area. It's only a couple of years old. Mm -hmm. I can I can imagine there there would be some implementation issues. I mean, this is essentially a way to en enact democracy and guarantee some form of, of democracy or direct democracy um, and the legitimacy of that vote or voting system. It, it could be, it, it, it could be democracy, but actually right now democracy is very hard to do on blockchain because you have to prove that somebody's a real human and that's un, unsolved. It's much easier to do like a sort of uh, a wealthocracy where people just get votes in proportion to their wealth. That's very easy. Fash. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh fash again. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I just have my little fash thing here, just to just to push back. You know, just to just, just, not yeah, let, yeah, not let you get over. <laughs> is is that fat? I mean, is rich people fash or is that more libertarian? I mean, those are really far apart, though. <sighs> Depends who you ask. <laughs> like, <laughs> if libertarians aren't fash, <laughs> yeah. I mean, any. I think any sort of. Um, any anything departing in in any significant way from i don't know utopian socialism is just pretty much fash nowadays so yeah but but i mean to to answer the sort of more serious version of this you know it is possible that that um blockchain technology can take us to a place where you have decentralized autonomous organizations which basically give people votes in proportion to their wealth uh but also have a secondary system that takes inputs once you have a proof of human system that proves that people are real human beings and then they can give inputs into it. The problem with, with, the problem with ordinary real human beings giving inputs in, into any system of rules is ordinary human beings are very bad at thinking about rules, really bad. So, so you would have to have a very, very sophisticated interface to take the preferences of human beings and turn them into rules that those human beings could live by uh, in an automated way. Yeah. Um, it, and the, it, would ha it would take a lot of work the, to make the sure. question of, of preference itself i think is to me essentially the crux of you know why not necessarily i don't know either rationalist or post-rationalist it's yeah. the idea that you know preferences are remotely tied to one what you actually want which is a mm. very strange i mean idea anyway what yeah. you will want in 10 years which is essentially what mm -hmm. you're voting on you know usually in a, in a democratic uh, system um and it's subject to so many fluctuations variations just you know if the weather yeah. changes i might have you know a change of heart um you know the the substrate the rational substrate is not rational at all and uh even even i can and i'm just like i'm someone who thinks about politics and you know all sorts mm -hmm. of things like that all all day I, I don't trust myself at all to make good decisions. <laughs> I know this yeah, is, yeah. sorry to- Well, an, another, another, this, yeah, true. I mean, an, another power there is the power of, of exit. So, um, you know, you can, you can have maybe a city state uh, that's run using uh, a decentralized autonomous um, organization. And if you don't like it, you can exit get out yeah. move out yeah and um, you you had a, a really interesting idea um the the personal ai or personalized oh yeah or, yeah and i think that's uh that you know might be a you know at least a partial solution to to some of this so um can you yeah. expound yeah sure so this isn't really well i did think of this but steve Alejandro also thought of this um like the, so so if you imagine that human beings are these basically animals, right? I mean, we're just, you know, chickens or squirrels or monkeys or whatever. Monkey, but, yeah. But yeah, return to monkey, yeah. Uh, we're just animals. And, you know, in the, in the modern world, we have all of these different things that are sort of taking advantage of us. We have, you know, the addictive food, drugs, or, you know, pornography, or a, mil a million other things that, that really kind of take advantage of people. Um, so instead of people, who are kind of vulnerable and easy to exploit interacting with something like Facebook or Google or OnlyFans or, you know, Neuralink when it, when it comes online, like this is Elon Musk's uh, brain computer interface thing. Um, 
instead of humans interacting with that, you have an agent, a sort of uh, a sort of guardian angel, if you like, um, which is sort of like an expected utility maximizer, and it has some idea of what your goals are, and all of these different malevolent or hostile uh, sort of optimization processes that we find around us, they can't they can't directly interact with you. So like Facebook cannot directly send you a notification. It sends the notification to your personal AI and then your personal AI decides whether it's good for you right now to see your 15th Facebook notification for the day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so how, I mean, obviously this personal AI doesn't exist now, but I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, what, what the holes might be, you know, how subject to, to personal choice is the setup of this AI? Is it kind of, is it a, a, a local tyrant that will tell you what's good for you? Or is it well, something you can figure? Presumably, presumably it's like the software that I use for my phone. You know, every couple of weeks I, I get to alter the settings to what I want. And then, you know, I decide, okay, I, my phone's basically going to turn into a brick after 11 PM. And I'm happy with that. I want to prevent myself from being tempted by that. I want to yeah. have, you know, but quiet, Rocco, quiet time. That's you. If you give this uh, the personal AI to the crack addicted prostitute um, with yeah. her, you know, <laughs> with her optimization function <laughs> about her ideal life, you know, given her constraints, um, yeah. if she sets up her her personal AI, will she be able to set it up differently, or is there a <laughs> kind of some some essential constraint built in? Well, I mean, there's the the problem there is that the the addiction is like a physical substance. It's not it's not accessing you through the digital world. It's accessing you through the physical world, and it's much more difficult to write software that will protect against that. But I mean, maybe for the sake of argument, we could say instead of you know a, a, somebody who's addicted to drugs, we could say it's someone who's addicted to let's say porn. So, you know, you would have someone who's addicted to porn and maybe you have, you know, he has a personal AI. I'm, I'm kind of assuming his gender is male, but you know, it could be a woman. Um, <laughs> he has his personal AI and it's, you know, he can set it up to block all porn on all of his devices. So if it, it's, got a, it's got a convolutional neural network, uh, you know, it's been trained to recognize naked bodies. And when it sees one, uh, instead of displaying it on the screen, it will display just a blurred out rectangle. And it will do mm. that on every device. It will be impossible to watch porn on anything that he owns. And then yeah. maybe every month he can review it and decide whether he The guy will it. start getting aroused by, by blurred rectangles, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Moaning blurred rectangles. That's my fetish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, it sounds actually like a... a a good solution i would i would definitely appeal to the the ai i would probably get, be very angry with it especially if it kept me away from my favorite things um <laughs> so but also it's kind of like you know a, a benevolent dad you know tough love and stuff you know you tough do love, yeah yeah I've, tough I've, love except you except you have exit rights right if you if you really want to exit you can exit uh, yeah, but how hard is it to exit? I think that's, that's another... You, you get, well, the way I've set my phone up with this app um, is, uh, you know, I set a time. I say on the 1st of January, 2021, I will be able to change these settings. But until then, I can't change it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. And you, you know what? <laughs> you know what? Actually, one week I decided, oh, you know, I'll just make it a little bit easier for myself since I have the option because it's kind of inconvenient. And then I was like, oh, I'll just make it a little bit easier. And then pretty quickly, I just removed all the restrictions and I was wasting way too much time on it. And I was like, no. Yeah. I, I think strict. Apple is trying to move into this direction very slowly and very tentatively mm -hmm. with their kind of app restrictions and things that they've built into the phone. They are very bad. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work, but it it's there and it seems to be yeah. something they're trying to do. Um, so I think it would probably have to be a hardware manufacturer or something because the people who are selling you the crack, they don't, probably don't want to, to be the builders of the AI um, or, or some, some form of, uh, yeah, some form of thing that you've already paid for. <laughs> Yeah, see, so, so you, you do, you, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you, if, if it's Google, who, so at the moment, the big tech companies like Google, they already have this stuff, right? So if you go on like YouTube or whatever, there's already like a kind of um, a thing where you can review how many hours you spent on YouTube um, and like monitor your time to make better choices. But I think they deliberately make these things bad and toothless because they, their interests are just not aligned with protecting you.
Yeah, I mean, so. this whole post hook uh, post hoc analytics <clears throat> is is great, it's but it just it's makes useless. me feel shit about myself, and I never no, watch it again. It's totally useless. It's totally useless, and I'll tell you why it's totally useless. It's the same as the the food thing, where you know, you in order for something to not be tempting, you need it to not be easy to get. Right. Yeah. So it's like the the jar of Nutella that's in a safe a hundred miles away is not tempting. It's just, it, you just, it's not exciting. Yes, maybe technically you could get in your car and you could drive there and put in the combination and get it, but nobody would ever do that. If the, if the, you know, no, nobody would be that desperate for it, right? But if it's right there, so the problem is if you have post hoc analytics, they put whatever the temptation is right there in front of you, make you consume it a lot, and then yeah, make you feel guilty about how much you consumed. Exactly. And I think that's quite a vicious circle. Like, I feel like people have, you know, they fall prey to all of these optimization functions. And then the solution is from even from the tech giants just telling you, oh, you should just be more responsible. In no, your you use. Should, you should, no, you shouldn't. <laughs> you should, you should bind yourself so that you don't have the choice because yeah. human beings run on corrupted hardware. Exactly. Yeah. So just reduce choice restrict yourself you should restrict yourself so that you cannot make these choices and i think that's where it comes back to to trad to traditionalism a lot of the good side of trad of traditions of, of traditional social arrangements is that they remove choices from you you know they remove choices that they that that you know the elders and that the society as a whole knows will be bad for you now, sometimes they can go too far with this and it becomes oppressive. And a lot of people push back and say, you know, traditionalism is bad because it oppresses people. It removes way too much choice. And I think that's actually correct. Um, I think if you look at most or many, certainly traditional institutions and churches, they go over the top with this. Um, yeah. But it's a fundamentally a, a good idea. Yeah, I think it's it's a hard balance to strike because, you know, it's kind of a bit of a slippery slope thing. You know, everyone says this is a fallacy, but I think the, the slippery slope no. is a bit of an iron, iron no, rule. It's, 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 it's not a fallacy. Yeah, and, um, you know, I think once a traditional society lets in a little bit of flexibility, you know, essentially you have the, the slippery slope problem <laughs> where, you know, so I think traditional societies tend to be more rigid than they might need to be. At, you know, if you have one iteration of the society, just because yeah. they need to, you know, enforce themselves so that everything else gets enforced, so it keeps the coordination. Yeah. Value. I mean, the, the problem is they have to, they have to enforce their rules with humans, which is a problem because those humans themselves can become corrupted or seduced by whatever the temptation is. And then they start letting more of it in and the whole thing collapses very quickly. Exactly, exactly. And that's why, you know, I, I, I don't know, I've, I've been really very much co-opted into this whole trad meme on, on Twitter, but I, uh, you know, though I have some, some trad beliefs, I think trad in a, in a traditional, you know, return fashion is, is just Im impossible to do because it's essentially a, a constraint coordination uh, element where essentially the, the society around you being trad uh, will constrain you to be this way, which you would not na naturally act like, you know, you have other yeah. tendencies, you would, might yes. try to optimize for like proximal benefit for like, just, you know, consequentialist stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, there's, there's actually even worse problems than that. Um, there's, there's this theory I've heard where you have some kind of, if you, and this is actually a really big one, you have some kind of arrangement where for a long time, some particular type of person is oppressed in some way or, or restricted, let's say, right? So it might yeah. be, for example, women, or it might be uh, teenage girls. So maybe for a long time, for hundreds of generations, teenage girls were sort of married off, handed off from the father to the husband without you know, really letting them out of the house very much or with, you know, putting them on a pretty tight leash, right? And so maybe there's a slight miss, you know, there's, there's like a genetic mismatch of interests between the genes of the parent and the genes of the daughter, where the genes of the daughter would very much like to mate with a very high status man and get the parents to uh, care for the resulting child. Um, whereas the, the parents have to worry about not just that particular daughter, but the other seven. So they don't want that to happen. They want the daughter to mate with maybe a low status man, which is less valuable in terms of genetics, but then he's going to look after the, the children, right? So 
there, there's there's a conflict of interest there. So the way the way this conflict of interests used to play out is that the parents themselves would constrain the daughter a lot. You can't go and meet strange boys until you get married, and then then you get married to your husband, and then you know you have like church morality, and you have to be faithful to husband stuff like that. So maybe what happens is that the daughter's genes sort of push against this very very strong restraint and so because they never encounter a lack of restraint or they're always restrained they can push very hard and only get very small increases in the amount of the behavior they want so let's say the amount of um let's say, say you know the the amount of um going after hard to get hard to commit alphas that they really want is like a five out of ten the amount that the parents are letting them is you know like a three out of ten then they're going to push for like a 10 out of 10 but they're never going to get that they're going to they're going to get up to a four maybe but then you have modernity that comes along and says oh no freedom everyone's equal everyone's free you, you can't constrain women that's sexist and then the, the genes have never been in this situation or very rarely been in a situation where they're completely unrestrained and they get a 10 out of 10 you know they sleep with a criminal or something like that who's just got out of prison um and it's a total disaster and the woman's life completely goes off the rails before it's even had a chance um and this is this is actually similar to what happens when i eat nutella um you know as a hunter gatherer my genes would be going through this environment where you know the environment is very very strongly constraining the amount of calories that are available right so my brain is pushing very very hard to maximize the amount of honey i eat which is the, the natural equivalent right uh but it never gets the 10 it never gets the 10 out of 10 honey it gets like a three three and a half out of 10 um, but it can still push maximally and then suddenly in the course of one or two generations the restriction on the amount of calories you can eat is removed um and your brain is still pushing for a 10 because that's just what it does, right? That's its, mm -hmm. that's its adaptation that it's executing, is I want 10 out of 10 honey, I want 10 out of 10, you know, um, sort of like fast, easy sex with lots of people. Um, I, I want like 10 out of 10, you know, addictive notifications because those weren't part of our ancestral environment. I want everything, I want all of these things maxed. And it's sort of you know, it's trained in an environment where you just couldn't max these things. But then modernity says, yeah, okay, there you go. You get tens on all of them. And then you end up fat. Maybe, you know, your daughter ends up like, you know, having a, being a single mom with, with the dad being in prison or something like that. And all sorts of other things happen because we have a system which is executing adaptations um, in, in an environment that it's just not adapted to. Exactly. I think that's, um, that's, that's spot on. Um, and I think that's essentially the, the biggest constraint with traditionalism. You would need like absolutely crazy levels of decentralization and voluntary constraint. You essentially opt into, um, you know, kind of like a neo Amish type, you know, neo Luddite organization where yeah. you kind of, well, it doesn't have to be Luddite. I mean, you're still allowed to have technology, right? <clears throat> it's, it's not blocking out all technology. If you have a piece of technology that lets you fix, you say you break your arm and there's some magical technology that just fixes it instantly. You wouldn't need to get rid of that because there's, you know, as far as I can see, it's not going to be particularly harmful to unbreak people's arms quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Just to, that's essentially the, the constraint there is just that, you know, it's hard to predict which technologies are going we'll to, you know, yeah. will be dangerous. Yeah. And uh, what, what can go off the rails. And I can see why people are, you know, a bit, you know, reticent or want to be very, very careful with that. Um, but I think that that kind of leads us to the idea of self-constraint. And I, this is kind of the area where I see, um, you know, a lot of promise. And I see people doing this, like people who are, you know, essentially the, the people who have the money, who are, um, you know, are betters, <clears throat> the Silicon Valley CEOs, and, you know, they, they essentially, what, what are they doing? They're retreating from modernity. They go into, you know, 10 silent retreats. They're fasting. They're essentially living lives like, you know, Orthodox monks. Uh, you know, Jack already looks like an Orthodox monk. Um, <laughs> you know, even, I even know rationalists who have essentially now become like traditional Catholics. Um, not even sure if they believe in God, but they've definitely bought into this memeplex of a, of a kind of a, you know, plug and play 
traditional lifestyle uh, which they buy into also kind of like orthodox jews are, are coming up so i think this uh voluntary self-constraint in a way kind of like uh the the personal ai but you know in the absence of the personal ai you know maybe using yeah. catholicism as your personal ai um mm. you know it's it's coming up but it's only coming up for a very select group of people who understand what the optimization functions are doing to everyone else yeah. Yeah. um and I've actually I read I think I read this in a book by Tyler Cowen, um, and he sees the the world of the future essentially as these you know huge suburbs of people who um, essentially are plugged into you know sensor stimulators. They're just having fun, you know, consuming fun calories, you know, having the fun sex with I don't know whatever automatons. It'll, it'll, be, it'll yeah, it'll be with like a, a VR. Kind exactly, of, uh, and then yeah. you have I don't know the, the upper class, you know, the the people who restrain themselves who have yeah. learned the value of restraint or, or are conscientious enough to be able to restrain themselves because it's also a, a, you know it's a, it's a genetic thing personality thing there's all sorts of factors that flow into it um you know how um how realistic do you think this scenario is it's, it's scary it's pra practically guaranteed oh it's, god <laughs> uh, there's almost no way out of this the i think the only the the, uh, the, the only hope that we even potentially have is is of increasing the set of people in in the second group and decreasing them in the first um, because there are going to be people who will sort of naively just sort of offer themselves up to the bad guys and they will get just grabbed and they will be plugged into some kind of uh you know highly optimized sensory experience and they will just that's it you know they might die they might get some kind of state benefits or something, but their their lives, their real lives will essentially be over and they will be stuck in some kind of virtual environment. Um, yeah, but and, isn't that better in a way? It's kind of like Brave New World. But, it'll, but, but look at look at the phone games that people are playing. It'll be Candy Crush and, and like, what's the other one? What's the really cancerous... Uh, Angry Birds, uh, angry, No, no, the no, the the one that um, Raid old. Shadow Legends. It'll be Raid Shadow Legends. I have no idea. Have you not heard of that? It's so cancer. It's it, like <laughs> there was one point they they were like every third YouTube video had a Raid Shadow Legends sponsorship because they were just obviously their business is so profitable that they could basically afford to email every single YouTube content creator and ask for a, for a sponsorship. And that what their business is is basically it's a it's like a a, a highly um, it, it, it's a sort of highly um, stripped down uh, role playing game where you have a party of four sort of heroes and and weapons and you, you go and like do attacks but there's there's no like movement or anything you, there's literally just a button for like attack and your guys attack uh, and then there's like a monster and you kill it and then you go on to the next stage and the game the gameplay itself is so boring that they built a, an auto play button into it because it's boring to play and people that yeah they did and but people people get addicted to it because it's just really like they've really maxed out the addictiveness of it and they give you like gems and they you have levels that you progress up and stuff like this so what i you know what i think the future of of humanity is going to be is most people will be plugged into something like raid shadow legends except it'll have like it'll have tits and it'll have like, you know, um, sensory stimulation and, and, and it'll, it'll be VR. It'll be like plugged into your brain via a neural interface or something. Most people will just be plugged into something like that. And it won't even be that much fun. It'll just be really addictive and mm -hmm. it'll just, and they'll get a benefit from the government and they will sign over their, almost their entire benefit to this game slash entertainment thing that they're plugged into. Uh, and then they'll have like some basic food and stuff that they'll they'll have on the side. Yeah, I mean, if you if you look at uh, a kind of low conscientiousness communities, you know that's already happening. I it's mean, already, you have yeah, exactly. It is Patty Power in, and the nail salons, and there's Patty Power. Yeah, it's 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 already happening. We just it it just takes people. I'm going to sound a bit arrogant here. It takes people like us to just notice this to notice the road we are already going down we're going to go down this road a lot more um yeah. people are going to be predated by optimized systems it, it's unclear 
like whether the future is going to be more peaceful or more violent. Um, but it's definitely going to be more dangerous for human beings. And it's going to be dangerous in this sort of insidious way where your life is, it's not like they're going to come and blow you up with a scary robot, at least not at first. It's going to be that gradually everything valuable in your life is going to get optimized away by these, these systems that, that prey on, uh, on human beings. And the, the sad thing about, you know, things that are so good, they're addictive is addictiveness has a certain pattern where, you know, it's fun for a while and then you hate yourself. It's, you know, it's that yeah. the self-loathing and then yeah. you just, you know, you play Shadow Legends or you go on to X platform or you eat the, the burger for the 10th time this week and you hate it and you hate yourself yeah. and it's really bad, but you have yeah. to keep going because it's, this yeah. is what you do now. This is who you are. This is so who you are now, yeah. It's, yeah, it's absolutely. really terrible because, you know, it's like, oh, you know, it's just fun. It's Soma. It's, you know, everyone's going to feel good. But no, it does. It but they doesn't don't feel, feel good. good. They feel bad, but they're addicted. And I think, and and I think, what's going to happen with the human race is that there is going to become this sort of, you know, addicted underclass who are just going to be, they're just going to be cannon fodder for, you know, whatever the next, you know, addictive thing is. And it's going to be like the the, the one that I like to think about, as I said, is is OnlyFans, but with uh, a brain computer interface. So you know, you'll just plug yourself into this. And you'll have this, um, you know, this thing, which will probably not even be a real woman. It'll probably, because you see, in, in a couple of years, it will be easier to make, um, a, it'll easy, be easier to program an AI to maximize the, um, the sort of the, the attractiveness value and the engagement value with each user than to have a real woman doing it. So it'll basically be an AI kind of virtual sex bot that can then sort of stimulate your mind directly and people will just plug into that yeah and then they'll, they'll plug into like you know maybe it'll be integrated with uh, a role-playing game as well so you're going around your raid shadow legends and you're using your your government basic income to buy like purple gems so you can buy new armor for your girlfriend who's actually not a real girl she's an ai and then later she'll thank you for buying the gems and she'll have virtual sex with you uh and then you'll need some more gems and you know like it'll, I mean, it sounds crazy, but um, but I think this is the way it's going. And as, as you've said, it's already happening. You already have gambling. It's so easy to addict people. It's so we're so vulnerable. We're so easy to exploit um, that that it's going to be really hard to avoid this. And the, and you know, the libertarian types will enable this because they'll say, oh, these people are choosing it. No, they're not choosing it. They're being hacked. It's like if you if you send your browser to a to a web page with uh, zero day exploits for your system, your browser isn't choosing to get hacked. It's getting hacked. Um, and with, with human beings, it's the same thing. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's the, the main distance between me and libertarianism, which I have to say, I was they, a libertarian for a yeah. while, but it's, uh, that's, you know, once, once you realize the corrosiveness of, of free choice and also these huge optimization functions that essentially yeah. are the market, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's not that cool anymore. You want to, you want to go see something funny, go to the Nutella website. I, I did this, right? Just, just <laughs> I'm <fun>. scared. <laughs> I, went, I went to the Nutella website. They have an FAQ. They don't have nutrition information, or at least I couldn't find it. But they have an FAQ. And one of the questions is, is Nutella safe for humans to consume? And the answer is just like a one line. It's yes, it's completely safe. And it's like, why are you even asking this? Jesus Christ. <laughs> yes it's, you know, is is raid shadow legends safe for people to play yes it's completely it's safe for people to play is only fans safe for uh for porn addicted men to use yes it's completely safe exactly. uh no you know the, the libertarians will enable this they'll be like oh yes no the people are just choosing this um but then when it's their own children they'll be like uh oh, mate can we get one of those personal ai things to like protect <laughs> them a little bit please <laughs> exactly <laughs> but but you know there, ha there has to be exit any system that you set up is better with exit in my opinion because the system itself you know we for a lot of this conversation there's there's been some sort of assumptions some exogenous assumptions about systems that are just going to work and save us um and, and systems, as we've seen in the, in the 20th century, um, can often go wrong very badly. Communism went wrong very badly. Nazism was, was very, very bad. Um, these systems can, can be terrible if, if the systems themselves are bad. So central, centralization, um, fragile sort of inflexible control from a central power, cults of personality, all these things are terrible. 
um, so that so you know we do need to set up systems which have ways for people to exit them. And there are bad systems like North Korea where you don't have exit rights. You literally get machine gunned if you try and exit North Korea, which is terrible. Exactly. And I think, uh, you so know, that's uh, the scary part of this, you know, idea of, you know, global government, supranationalization, everything. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's no way to solve, you know, global coordination problems without a supranational government. Yeah, maybe not. You, I feel no. like you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater and then also, you know, setting the world on fire. Uh, it's, you know, there's no exit from global government. If, you know, if the, if Big Brother really controls everything, whatever benevolent uh, ideas mm. they, they have, um, you it's just not sustainable. You want... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we're going to have global government for a while, though, because because we have America and we have China and we have Europe and we have Russia and they're, they're not going to they're not just going to start doing global government i don't think there's there's at least there's at least kind of three or maybe four spheres that are gonna, that are gonna yeah no but i think just just in the abstract you keep hearing oh, in the abstract yeah especially for people who are like concerned about the environment and i understand you know there there are you know complex externalities that you need to account for at a global level because of the environment but yeah baby bathwater situation you know it's uh it's, it's quite hard to to align at that level i think if you have sovereign national entities <clears throat> it's 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 an even better playing field to coordinate at that level um you know no one no one assures you that the supranational global government will have the best solution for it but you know if you have negotiations yeah. between multiple parties you might actually get somewhere yeah <clears throat> yeah Potentially, potentially. I mean, obviously, technology is also going to play a role in how that plays exactly. out. Exactly, and it so has, that, and it yeah. has multiple times. Mm. So, mm. before we wrap this up, I have a question mm. that I want to ask you, which okay. I hope to make the question of the show, um, which is uh, the the most neglective, subversive thinker that you know of that other people might not know of most, outside of Rocco, obviously. <laughs> Okay, but not my. I can't vote for myself. Sorry. The most neglected subversive thinker. Wow, that's a that's a tough one. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, or your neglected, favorite. You know, it doesn't neglected. Have to be. Neglected by whom? Are you neglected by your audience or neglected in general? I think probably neglected in general. I don't want to make this so complicated because my audience is obviously, mm. you know. Yeah. Well, if I was if I was going to give, you know, some general figures. Um, I think um, Nick Land's stuff is pretty, pretty neglected in terms of how important it is. Partly because he's kind of a little bit lazy, I think. <laughs> uh -oh. But um, but his, you know, basically. Well, I don't want to take up too much time, but but his his yeah his his stuff is pretty important because he he came up with this idea of. Um, sort of technology, kind of basically eating us up. Um, and, and he even kind of thinks it's in some sense good um, that like, you know, we're kind of, uh, we're just a bootloader for- um, yeah. Accelerationism. For, like, accelerationism, yeah. We're, we're just the bootloader. Well, you know, it's good that we get deleted. And, and I think that's horrific. I completely disagree. But uh, Nick Land's stuff, you should definitely- Not, not very it. trad. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've read Nick Land. Uh, I mean, I've tried- Well, I've tried... maybe it's it's trad if you look at it on a, on a, on a large enough time scale where it's like, you know, humanity is just it's just like not good enough like you know we're just we're just like you know it's like it's like that tough love of like i'm sorry humanity you're just not good enough Something oh my god the the, the cosmic fash daddy <laughs> cosmic fash daddy yeah whipping us yeah. into shape you well not whipping us into vermin. shape just killing us just <laughs> killing true. us off and replacing us whipping us into a different maximum. shape a paperclip maximizing. Think, yes, suit. yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Replacing with a, with a, with a paperclip maximizing superintelligence that, that we would find horrific. Um, so yeah, I mean, also Robin Hanson's stuff. Uh, I think I, I'm his number one fan. I love. His I stuff. love Even Robin Hanson. <laughs> I just read. I just read his book Age of M, and I told him it was bad. Um, but I'm his number one fan. Um, <laughs> I love his stuff. It's yeah. too long. It's too. It's just too long. It's too long and too boring. He needs. To, he needs to cut it. Um, yeah, he's he's an exceptional thinker, yeah. mid middling communicator for sure. Yeah, yeah, it, it yeah. is. It's 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 a real it's a real tool to force. And his book, The Elephant in the Brain, is is the number one book that you should read. Uh, I love it. Yeah, amazing. yeah. yeah I completely. Did a did a very very successful thread on signaling after I read that, which I completely ripped off from the book because it's just so good. And yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's really good. Um. um 
so yeah, I mean, I guess those would be like uh, kind of in general. Maybe to your readers, I, I might suggest Brian Tomasic, actually, uh, because Brian Tomasic stuff to do with um, you know consciousness and suffering. You know, he thinks that video game characters might, in some sense, be conscious and suffering. Um, maybe just a little bit. So when you play Call of Duty, you're, you're like causing like micro sufferings when you kill the bad guys, and that's that's another interesting subject. So just uh, kind of like sure. a, a panpsychism of the of the game it's, world. It's a sort of algorithmic panpsychism. It's not like a rock is conscious. It's but it's like once the video game character has like you know goals and mm -hmm. beliefs, then it's kind of like conscious in some sense, and maybe in the same sense that we are, but just less. Yeah, so minimum viable consciousness. Yeah, I don't think he thinks there is a minimum oh, okay i mean so I, my, it, my, views, of... my views my views are kind of similar to his but also a little bit different but, but that's like a huge massive debate we can't we can't talk about that's but, but very yeah. cool yeah, I've, yeah i haven't heard of brian tomasic but i'll yeah. check well, him out there you go if you, awesome. if you if you're if you if you read all that stuff you read all my stuff uh and you're already infused in this uh, sphere go and go and check out brian tomasic Awesome. Well, Rocco, if you have uh, anything to plug outside of your very uh, e extraordinary, relatively new uh, Substack. Uh, oh, yeah, my Substack, yeah. Heretical <laughs> update, <laughs> .substack.com. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can check out my Substack. Um, uh, yeah, check out my Substack. Uh, you can also check out my B-Minder to see whether I'm uh, succeeding with my weight loss goals, but uh, that's Ooh, probably not so um, interesting. I've, I've, put it on, I've put it on my Twitter profile for now, so uh, people Like a Google. Ulysses pact for your weight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll, I, there's some stuff I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write off my uh, Substack, and there's one or two posts there already. Um, yeah, that, that'll be it. Awesome. Well, it was awesome to have you on, and uh, yeah, thank you for coming. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Cheers.